Hi there. On this show, I'm going to share the number one lie that the devil tells almost all of us. You're not going to want to miss this. Do you already think you know what heaven and hell are all about? Is there nothing more to know and nothing new to learn? Let Lori Ditto open your eyes to the unseen world as she shares from the heart what she has learned when God took her to both places. She reveals all the wondrous workings of a glorious heaven and all the unspeakable horrors of a hell to be avoided at all costs. What you will see and hear is beyond your imagination. Join Lori Ditto and make today count. Hi there, I'm Lori Ditto. Welcome to Make Today Count. You know, every day is important. And if today, if today you could love like Jesus loved, did you know by the end of the day, you would be sure that this day is counting in heaven, counting for you in heaven and helping many others love like God loves. On today's show, I'm going to be sharing about the sins that are in hell and the biggest lie that I found there. So to begin with, I'd like to look at James 3.16. This is what it says. In James 3.16, it says, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Another version, another way of saying it would be that where there is selfish ambition, huh? Where there is selfish ambition, there's every other evil thing. And you know, I'm naturally an ambitious person, but oh my goodness, do I have to be careful because it's so easy to fall into selfish ambition. And when you're there, that really is an amazing place to allow every evil thing to come and join you there. You know, there are two types of sins. There's the sins of omission and the sins of commission. What does that mean? The first one is the one where you don't realize you're sinning. And the second one is where you knew it was a sin and chose to do it anyway. Whether you were thinking, oh, I'll repent after or not, you knew it was sin. You knew you shouldn't do it, but you did it anyway. And those sins are so dangerous. You can be guilty. You are guilty of both sins, but the punishment for the sins of omission are looked at differently than the sins of commission. Absolutely makes perfect sense. I want to talk about Matthew 18 because when I was in hell, I understood Matthew 18 with a unique clarity. Let me break it down in my own words. So in it, some disciples come and they ask Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive my brother, Lord? Seven, and seven is a lot of times. And the Lord gave him an answer, no, 70 times seven, meaning you have to forgive your brother and keep on forgiving him. Well, that makes it very, very hard. It's almost like, how can you do that? How can you keep on forgiving? And so they were baffled, they were confused. And so to fix their confusion, Jesus told them this parable. But inside of this parable, you're going to find the truth of the kingdom of God. So in it, Jesus starts out, there is this king. Obviously he's a benevolent king. And he calls in his servant who owes him uh, a debt. That debt, I did some research, is 5,173 lifetimes. A lifetime being 70 years. 5,173 lifetimes of debt. How did that guy ever rack up such a bill? But that was the bill. And the king says, pay me everything you owe me. And the servant says to him, oh Lord, please be patient with me and I will pay you back everything that I owe you. Hmm. So the king says to him, he says, your debt has been forgiven. That is remarkable. How wealthy must this king be that he could just forgive 5,173 lifetimes of debt, but that's what happened. 
And that servant goes out, he finds his brother who owes him a small debt. And that debt was three days wage. And he says, pay me what you owe me. And his brother says, please be patient with me. Same words, please be patient with me and I'll pay you everything I owe you. And no way. And he sends his brother, he sends him to, to jail. Well, when the king finds out about this, he calls that servant back and he calls him a wicked servant. Didn't I forgive you everything? And you, you couldn't forgive your brother a small debt? And then this king says something that's like, wow, go get all that debt, 5,173 lifetimes of debt and put it back on him. And then Jesus says this, and so my heavenly father will do to you also, Lori, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And I understood, this is what I understood. So I understood all that, but this is what had happened. You see, when that king had forgiven this debt that could not be paid, when he forgave it, he actually took the debt and gave something. Remember I told you when I was in heaven, God said many of the gifts that he had for me are things that he would give me and things he would take away. Well, the king had just done that. He had took away a debt, but what he had given this servant was a heart like his. Now it was true, it was a small start. And he walks out and gets his first test. Are you gonna be like that king? And we find out that instead of taking the king's heart and letting it grow, becoming more and more like this king, he just took the canceled debt as if he was mocking the king in the way the king's life. I understood that so clear in hell. I understood that that's what I had done. What I had done was mock Jesus here. He had forgiven me all of this debt and he had tried to give me this little heart like his but I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't forgive, wouldn't forgive, wouldn't forgive until finally I ended up in hell eternally for unforgiveness. This was very, very serious. When I was in my teardrop shaped cell, all of these stacks of sins. So, there isn't really, I have an ocean problem here. And if you've seen other shows, you understand that an ocean problem means I'm gonna have a really hard time explaining this. So for lack of a better understanding, please think of your sins stacked in this room like a nine by 13 card. And there were stacks of these sins that were in there. And the stacks of sins, first one that came into the room was you're not kind. So Lori, you're not kind. And there was this stack, nine by 13 stack of sins. And each one was processed. And these first was the sins of that people had done to me. I would not have been in hell if I had forgiven the stack of sins that had been done to me. And once I had processed all those, you're not kind. Then the room filled, this cell filled with all my unkind acts, two ways. My unkind acts for the sins that I had done, that I had not known I had done, and also the sins for the ones that I had done knowingly, being unkind. Did you know that God is watching? He is watching what I'm doing. He's watching what you're doing. He knows the condition of your heart. When he forgave me, when he forgave you, he gave you this little bitty heart that would be like his. And when Jesus said at the end of that parable, and so my heavenly father will do to you also, if you don't forgive your brother from your heart, we should be panicked right about now. Can you imagine all that debt? Where did God put it? You know, when God saved me and separated me from my sin and he would remember it no more, he stuck all that sin in the place where he puts things that he forgets about and that is hell. And my sin was in hell. And when I got there, 
it came back. So the first thing that I processed was, you're not kind. The second thing I processed is you're not gentle. And the third thing I processed hurt me so, so much. And when we come back from this break, I'm going to tell you about the one that hurt me more than any of the rest of them. I'll see you in a minute. Lori Ditto had 15 remarkable visions where she was taken to heaven and even firsthand experienced hell itself. Now she travels around the world as an evangelist and seer, where she shares straight from the heart the life-changing lessons she learned, backing them up with scripture and biblical truths. Lori has been called to speak and prophetically minister to people in matters of repentance and sin, humility, how unforgiveness can affect our destiny, and how the daily choices we make can either reflect God's heart or lead us away from God. Her desire is to see people escape hell and live out the principles of heaven here on earth. Through her books and additional trainings, conferences, and church meetings, Lori works to equip others to fulfill the Great Commission. Log on to MyFathersReputation.com where you can find out more about her ministry, products, watch her videos, and much more. And the one that hurt the absolute most was when all the sins came in about patience. I don't pray for patience. I always heard, don't pray for patience. But when I was in heaven, Jesus was so patient with me. The very first time I was there, when I first met him, you know, he wanted me to give him something, and all I would do was say no and look down, thinking God is going to beat me. But he was so patient. He was so kind. He was so gentle. I believe that the, that the sins are categorized in hell the same as the fruit of the Spirit. And there were sins that I had done that had counted in those three categories. Let me explain. When I was a young mom, I wanted to be a good mom. And so I wanted my daughters clean. And every day they had to take a bath, every day. And every day they had to get their hair washed so that it had that very fresh look to it. And they would cry when they got in the bathtub because they were sure I was gonna get shampoo in their eye. Well, first I bought the baby shampoo. It's not gonna hurt if it gets in your eyes. But I would soap up their hair and somehow that shampoo seemed to get in their eye because they would not sit still. And then they got the shampoo in their hair and I gotta get it out and I would put them down in the water and now it's a battle. I'd be trying to get that water, trying to get that shampoo out of their hair, and they'd be crying and everything. But I made sure my daughters looked good. But God counted it as a sin three times. You're not kind. You're not gentle. You're not patient. And another sin over here, you caused your children to feel like no one would listen to them. Like they weren't important. What they needed was not important to their own mother. Oh, God. Car seats. So I'd try and get my girls in their car seats. They did not like car seats. They would fight with me. They didn't want to be clipped in there. And, you know, we drive a long ways, 10, 12 hours to see family. So they knew once you clip them in there, they're going to be in there a long time. And they'd start crying and try and fight you and everything. And so I'd have to manhandle them, get them in there, manhandle them, buckle them in. Look at what a great mom I am. But it counted as four sins. You're not kind. You're not patient. You're not gentle. And you put fear in the heart of your children. Because no matter how distraught they are, you will not listen. God have mercy on me. And if I had just forgiven, if I had just forgiven other people who had hurt me, if I had just forgiven, it wasn't that I couldn't. 
It was that I wouldn't. And as those sins kept stacking up one after another, I hated when I was in hell. How do I know I hated? I really hated. I hated hearing the people scream, other people scream. I hated people being there. I filled myself up with hatred. And how was I able to fill myself up in, in hell with hatred? Because I had it on the earth. I'm not proud of this, but when I was, when I was younger, before I was saved, I didn't believe in divorce, but my marriage was falling apart. And so my answer to that was, Mike just needs to die. What kind of person wishes another person dead? It's called murderous heart. And anytime you let that in your life where you wish somebody else was dead, I don't care what they've done. God doesn't wish anybody dead. You allow hate, hate in your life. And I filled up with hate. I really was in the right place. And just what Jesus had said. And just what Jesus had said. If you will not forgive your brother from your heart, this same thing will happen to you. I had such a stony heart. I deserved hell. Everybody that's in hell deserves hell. Not because God wants them there. He doesn't. Because people will not listen. I want to share with you the biggest lie that Satan has done to bring multitudes of people to hell. Multitudes. It's like, well, if Satan has done it and he's able to trick that many people, what must it be? Now, remember, I told you when I was in hell, I was in an area with my family, but I was also in an area of hell that believers were in. It's like, no, Lori, believers don't go to hell. Well, then Matthew 18, when Jesus said, you've been forgiven, but it can all come back, isn't true. And there were people in hell, believers, just like me. I believed in Jesus Christ. It wasn't, it wasn't that I didn't love him. It was that I didn't obey him, right? So if you don't love him, you don't really obey him. And I didn't trust him because if you trusted him, you could obey him. It was pride. I thought I was going to do it a different way. I thought I knew better than God. How did that happen? You know, it started out with a truth that got twisted. What Satan feeds to people is God is so, 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 so good. And isn't that true? We can sing songs about the goodness of God, and they're all true. And if God is so good, he will never let anybody go to hell. Huh. There's the twist. God's not going to let anybody go to hell. Because it changed, right? It's not that you're letting yourself go to hell. It's that God would never let anybody go to hell. And, and it's true. God never let anybody go to hell. He sent his son. Jesus Christ paid the price. He spent all his blood to purchase me. God never let me go to hell. And so that's the pathway. The Satan gets you to this place. And as I say it, before you shut off, please hear me out. I mean, I've told this to people and right away they just shut off. The trick that Satan has it has a name. It's called Once Saved, Always Saved. And please, just give me a couple minutes to explain what I saw. Once saved, always saved means this. On the day that you were saved, God forgave you of all the sin of your past. That's true. On the day that I was saved, God forgave me of all the sin of my past. Once saved, always saved says, and then you were forgiven of all the sin you're doing today and all the sin you're ever going to do. 
You know what that means? That means that I don't have to worry about sin anymore. It means that I don't have to obey. Let me tell you what the reality and the facts are. The facts are on the day that I was saved, I was saved from every sin I've ever done. We're in agreement there, 100% agreement. And it's true, I understand that if I will repent, God will forgive me for my sin, but God has a problem with sin. Always has, always will. Hell was created for sin. Satan is in hell for sin. And you think about it, Satan messes with God. God creates hell and puts him there. Adam sins. God creates a plan. He sends his son, Jesus but you have to repent to receive the mercy. And so this once saved, always saved, and then it is an absolute lie that all of the sin, all of this sin that I've ever done in the future, I don't have to worry about. Oh, don't worry, you can cheat on your spouse. Oh, don't worry, you can steal a little bit. Oh, don't worry, you can lie. It's okay. That is a lie. And what we need to warn everyone about is that the biggest lie in hell, right now, that biggest lie is that don't worry. Once saved, always saved. Those people who are in hell, they were never saved at all. That's the lie. And there were lots of believers there believing this lie. Don't be one of those people. Search the scriptures, find out what's true. And we come back, we're gonna talk some more about this and other things. Thank you. The alarm is sounding. Heaven and hell are real. Where will you go? In Lori Ditto's book, The Hell Conspiracy, she shares her firsthand encounters of hell and the painful consequences of her own sin and unforgiveness. Through these pages, you will experience the stark terrors of a place where there is only hatred and no way out. They are six, between six and seven feet deep. And when I passed through, then all of a sudden these gates slammed shut. You would not believe the sound of those gates. It hurts my ears. It hurts my ears to even think what that sound was. These horrors are real, but this book offers a beacon of hope, providing an escape from the torment for those who receive salvation through Jesus. Log on to Lori Ditto's webpage and get your copy today. Too much pain in hell. Too many people who were deceived and once their eyes were opened, they really knew they knew all along, if God's going to hold all those lost people accountable, of course he's going to hold accountable to people in his church. Doesn't the scriptures teach us that the judgment of God will come first to his house? God loves. God loves. He made a way. There's no reason for any person to be in hell. He loves. It's Satan who hates. Satan who hates and wants to take you to hell so that he can hurt God. Let me read for us. Luke 16, 24 through 31 says, this is Jesus talking. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son, remember in your lifetime, you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this between you and us, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to there, here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. And then he said, I beg you therefore, father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they all come to this place of torment. I just want to give you my theory. I want to be sure that I'm telling you that this is my theory. But when I was in hell, I was consumed with hatred. It's what's there. I wasn't concerned about anybody else. 
You know why I didn't want people to come to hell? Because I didn't want to share in their pain. I didn't want all those people's sins to be a part of this place. That's why I believe this man said, go get my brothers. It wasn't because he loved his brothers so much. I think it was because he didn't want any more pain in his life. Now that is my theory. I didn't want one more person to come to hell. And what was so upsetting about it was while I was there, I was watching hell expand. It was growing. It was, it was being renovated for lack of a better understanding because a day is coming when multitudes of people are going to go to hell. Did you know there is a great, did you know there's a great, great falling away, getting ready to come? At the same time, there's going to be a great harvest, but there's a great falling away. You have to have been, you have to have been saved so that you can fall away. Those people are coming from the church. Sound an alarm. Warn the church. Judgment will come first to the house of God. We need help. We need so much help. Somebody say something. It's not popular what I'm saying. I love you. I love people. I'll tell them the truth. I'll tell them what Jesus told me. I'll tell them what I read here. Because people are going to hell. All kinds of people. What sin is going to take you to hell? The list goes on and on and on. Do you lie? Do you cheat? Do you steal? Are you stuck in some sort of sexual immorality? Are you having sex before you get married? Are you having sex with the same sex partner? Are you cheating on your spouse once you're married? All that is called sexual sin. Do you know none of that is going to heaven? None, none, none. And I'm not here to judge you. I'm not the judge. I'm just here to warn you. The scriptures teach, him we preach, warning every man, go warn every man. Go warn every woman, warn every child. Before it's too late, and it's not long. It's not long before it's too late. Let me read you a few scriptures as we're wrapping up here. We need to know this. Matthew 10, 28 says, Don't fear those who can kill the body and are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. 1 John 3, 8. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the work of the devil. That's what Jesus has come for. Jesus came to save us, to save me. He came to save you. You need to make sure you're really saved. Make sure you're saved. Your life depends on knowing what this word says. Don't trust it to just anybody. Amen.